it's just amazing what a privilege it is to to live in a world after Newton and Darwin and 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 Max Planck, um, and and to understand the universe in which you live, and that's a wonderful, I almost say spiritual experience. And it's so much grander and so much bigger and so much more worthy, worthwhile, than petty little concerns. Welcome to another episode of Conversations with me, Peter Bogosian. My guest today is a titan of intellectual discourse, a man whose work has transformed the world of biology and pushed the boundaries of thought related to religion and skepticism, an eminent scholar, author of The Selfish Gene, The God Delusion, and many others, a voice that has been a beacon for reason, critical thinking, and scientific integrity. Now he's embarking on a new journey to explore the poetry of reality through his own podcast. We talked about whether trans ideology is directly analogous to the Catholic belief in trans transubstantiation, the role of delusion for human beings, what to do about it, and much more. It is my honor to introduce one of my personal intellectual heroes and one of the most decent and kind people I know, Professor Richard Dawkins. Richard, thanks for having a conversation with me today. It's a pleasure, Peter. I, I appreciate it. How have you been? Very well, thank you. I, I never caught COVID as far as I know, did you? Really? Uh, no, I, not as far as I know, not at all. And I don't know why, because uh, I engage in a lot of high-risk activities. Well, I hid away for a year because I, I have Crohn's disease, so I'm immunocompromised. So I, I didn't, and in the beginning, you know, we didn't know how bad it was. And then after like a year and a half, I started doing wrestling, you know, jujitsu, which is like wrestling. And it's a high risk activity because you're re basically wrestling with 10, 12, 15 people an hour every day. And I never caught it. That's okay. You must have been well vaccinated then. Uh, yeah, I was. I was triple vax. I am triple vaxxed, boosted and vaxxed. But so, what do you? What do, we're here in Oxford. What What do you spend your day doing? What do you do in the day? I'm writing a book, just about finishing it, actually. Uh, and um, I'm just starting a Substack and a YouTube okay. channel and a podcast. Yeah, the poetry of reality. Yes, that's what the, that's what they're all called. Um, and also, just bought a house, and so oh, so really? um, uh, going to, that's being done up in, in a big way in Oxford. Uh, okay. Why did you buy it there? My family has lived there since 1726, oh, I think. Okay. So, and and wow. um, uh, my, most, of my, most of my, well, my sister's family and all, all there. Tell you about some things that I've been thinking about. And okay. You, you can give me a reality check and tell, you, tell me what you think. So for a long time, I wrote, you know, a manual for creating atheists and... I was trying to make the world more sane and more rational. And I was trying to help people become more thoughtful and reflect on their beliefs, have reliable epistemologies upon which they could rely. And one of the things that I noticed since maybe 2013, maybe 2012, was that as religiosity decreased, deranged woke beliefs increased. And I guess my first question to you is, uh, I, I don't know who came up with this. I might've come up with this. I don't know who came up with this, but the substitution hypothesis. Yes. So, so do you think, and I honestly do not know the answer to this question. Do you think that as one religion fades, another, like default is the belief state for humans. They just have to believe something. And, and as one, as the old religion fades, a new one has to come in. Yeah. Gullibility expands to fill the vacuum. Exactly. Something. Yeah. Precisely. I, I, I suppose that's right. I hadn't really thought of it before, but um, it sounds plausible to me. Um, I think G.K. Chesterton, who was a very religious man, right. um, said when people stop believing in God, they, they believe in anything. Yeah. Um, and um, he was a very witty, clever man, although he was a devout Roman Catholic. Yeah. Um, there's something in it, I think, and there's no doubt about it that um, we, are having, we seem to have exchanged one form of superstitious religiosity for another. Yeah. And the analogy goes pretty deep. Um, I think um, John McWhorter pointed out that 
there's a strong relationship between original sin in the Christian religion. Oh, that was me pointed that out. 2014, you out, yeah, yeah. Okay, that well, was my good. article with James Lindsay. Privilege is the original sin, but yeah, go ahead. Good for you. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, original sin being, we're all born in sin. We, we all inherit right. the sin of Adam. Right. We white people inherit the sin of slavery right. and colonialism. And because we're white, we have to feel guilty for what our, not necessarily our ancestors, but people of the same color as us yeah. in past centuries did. So that, that's one analogy. And then um, the, well, well transubstantiation, right. uh, which is in the Catholic religion, you know, um, the, the wine literally turns to right. blood, where literally doesn't quite mean literally. It means what Aristotle called the accidentals stay wine, but the, but the true substance of the wine becomes blood. Oh. So when somebody stands up and says, I am a woman, although they've got a, a male body, right. that's transubstantiation. Um, in the accidentals, they still have a penis and they still have Y chromosome, but in the true substance, um, they have become, um, they have become female. Um, so trans sub, well, that's where the word transubstantiation comes from, the yeah. transubstance. Yeah. And um, there's a very strong analogy to transubstantiation in transsexualism. Oh, uh, tell, tell me more, how so? Well, um, the, the wine becomes blood. And the when the priest simply declares it that, that it is. And a male person becomes female when he declares himself to be female. Uh, and um, in the Aristotelian terms, the substance has changed. Right. The substance of wine has changed to, to blood. The substance of maleness has changed to femaleness. But the accidentals, the incidentals, uh, are, are, are what are regarded by Catholics as trivial and by trans people as trivial. So they, they really believe that they have become the other sex. It's remarkable how obvious it is that those are delusions. I mean, it's crystal clear to anybody not caught in the orbit of the ideology that that is a delusion. Yes. Um, they get around it by this word gender, which, which is separate from yeah. sex. And there, there are some who, who I think even think their sex has changed. Correct. And others who think that they admit that their sex hasn't changed, but their gender has. Um, yeah. So I guess I have two questions. One is, it seems to me that there are degrees of delusion that one can have. So if we accept that, like there, certain things that are like if i told you everybody you know those books are really aliens from another planet and they've come out okay that's another level of delusion and so i often think this is the thing that that's been causing me to think about this i'm utterly incredulous at the sheer madness that people believe now in a way that i was not incredulous you, you know in 2010 or 2001 so it so let's take a look at somebody walked on water. This guy named Jesus, he walked on water. You know, this is a in intervention in the space con time continuum by a supernatural being and it caused this individual to walk on water. Okay, that's clearly a delusion. If somebody believes in it, if someone accepts that as true. And then you have the belief that men can get pregnant. That to me, seems like a significantly more profound delusion. Yes. Or, or am I wrong? I think it doesn't it come from the postmodern belief that feelings are more important than facts. Yeah, standpoint Something, epistemology. Yeah. Yeah. And it comes I guess they, they could just say that it it's the redefinition of the word, but they actually like they literally believe men can get pregnant. And the thing that I've been thinking about is kind of goes back to Plato. Is it better to let people believe benign delusions? I mean, in an ideal world, people wouldn't believe, people would proportion their confidence in the belief to the evidence they have for the belief. But humanity is sloppy and messy. And the thing that I've been thinking about recently is 
if it's true that there are degrees of delusion, and if it's true, and I don't know if it's true, that there's a substitution hypothesis, then should rational people um, step out of the way or not encourage people to believe things that are false? Because I would never do that, and I think that's grossly unethical. But um, there are certain delusions that are better for people to believe in mass than others. Yeah, so if you've got to believe in a delusion, if, if there's something, some law that says you, there's a certain quotient of deludedness that everybody's got to have. Right. And certain, some, <laughs> some are more harmless than others. And Correct. So, and Correct. So, I mean, I, I, th I sort of feel this a little bit about Islam and Christianity, yeah. that, that um, um, Islam is, is such an evil at the, at the moment, yeah. or Islamism is such an evil at the moment, that in Africa especially, Maybe Christianity is a better alternative, and right. it may be that it's no good trying to pre pre preach atheism in Africa. Right. Um, and Christianity might be a better, a better alternative. I think Ayan Hersiali has suggested something yeah, similar she, to that. She, she has. I think the last one of the last times I saw you, I did a talk in Kamloops, Canada. Yes. And uh, it was uh, about deprogramming jihadis. Yes. And one of the things that they do when they deprogram jihadis is they don't use atheism or Christianity. They use more benign I interpretations of the Quran. And so I've just been wondering in terms of this, the... the so, so I no longer think it's true. I used to think it's true. If people just stopped believing the silliness, all of a sudden would have a flourishing of rational human beings that engaged each other and proportioned their beliefs to the evidence. But the last decade has shown that that's monstrously false. In fact, the last decade has shown that we now have wide-scale institutional capture of our institutions, particularly our academic institutions. Uh, I'm specifically referring to the United States, but I'm also referring to here. We, we went to Goldsmiths and did some videos the other day and places where the ideology has seeped in. And I've been thinking about like, how do you create a prophylactic to prevent an institution from succumbing to what's morally fashionable, you know, to, to, to succumbing to the new religion. So you're on the board of the University of Austin. I'm a founding faculty at the University of Austin. Today, the issues are free speech and open inquiry, which are under attack. But maybe tomorrow it's something that we can't even think about, right? Maybe we, I mean, who knows what it's going to be? So is there a way that you can you know, subspecies eternitatis, or is there a way that you can, I don't know what it would be like, write something into the mission statement, or what can you do to prevent an ideology from having a domino effect and just taking over whole scale institutions? Well, if you're right about the substitution hypothesis, that's yeah. a very pessimistic conclusion. Yeah. Uh, I don't my, know that I am. No, I, my, yeah. my whole life has been devoted to the idea that you, you simply argue in favor of evidence-based beliefs right. and uh, um, I suppose I'd take a rather sort of take it or leave it attitude. I mean, th yeah. th this is this is what the evidence shows. Yeah. Why don't you believe it? Um, but if you're right about the substitution hypothesis, then I'm rather inclined to give up. I mean, I, I don't know how to cope with that. Um, I used to think that the one thing that would make me want to die would be if I found myself in a world where I was surrounded by people who no longer believed in evidence and believed in something else other than evidence, somehow felt contempt for evidence. And mm. I hope we're not approaching that now. I, I, I don't, I mean, none of yeah. my friends are like that. Yeah, I was thinking about that, like, uh, talking about death as I get older, I've been thinking about my own death, but I wouldn't want someone to be kind to me on my deathbed because they thought that if they weren't kind to me, they were gonna go to hell. I would want someone to be kind to me because they wanted to be kind to me. Yes. Right? Yes. And so I, even this idea that there's this place where people burn or something, like I want people to be motivated not by something external to themselves, like a reward for being nice. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So, so I don't know. I mean, so this is what, okay. So this is one of the things that, that I've learned from thinking about this stuff for, I don't know, over a quarter century. And I'd love to hear what you think about it. I think, so, so we go around the country, we go around the world, we now go around the world, and we set these lines up 
uh, there are lines of tape on sidewalks. I don't know if you've seen me do this or not. And uh, strongly disagree, disagree, slightly disagree, neutral. Uh, it's like this tablecloth here. Uh, slightly agree, agree, strongly agree. And then we'll ask people a question like, should there be, uh, trans women should be in women's sports or uh, whatever, whatever it is. And one of the things that I've learned, and then we say three, five, four, three, two, one, go, and they walk to a line. And then I do street epistemology on them. I ask them why they believe it, what it would take them to change their mind. Sometimes people change, sometimes people don't. But here's what I've learned about this. And here's what I've learned, a, a key lesson in, in my intellectual life from the, the, the New Atheist Movement and from speaking to literally tens of thousands of people, prisons, everything, is that people will go to a line not based upon the evidence they have for the line, but they'll go to the line because they think that's the line that they should be standing on that makes them a good person. Yes, uh, and um, it, it may be the line that is compatible with the, their political Correct. tribe or Correct. religious tribe. Right. Um, I think Steven Pinker in his latest book has evidence that when we make our political judgment, we, I mean humanity, in, in general, yeah. it tends to be not based on evidence, but tends to be based upon tribal loyalty. Mm. And that's a very depressing conclusion. And by the way, um, one of the things that's been depressing me about my, my being sort of anti-woke and, and yeah. anti-the militant um, trans lobby is that people think I must be right wing. And I'm never, I've never been right wing. I've voted left all my life. <laughs> yeah. And um, it, I mean, I detest Donald Trump, for example. Right. But there are people out there on Twitter, especially who think right. that because I detest Donald Trump, therefore I must be a, an apologist for trans wokeism or, or vice versa. Yeah. So, so let's talk about that. I think, I think that that is an intentional tactic uh, of people. I think that that is what woke people use people who are have fallen to the have, been, have had their uh, cognitions hijacked to this ideology and i think it's very easy to write you off entirely if they say oh richard dawkins he, he's just a right-wing extremist mm -hmm. you know pinker he's a right-wing extremist although he's the second largest don donor to the democrats and hillary clinton and harvard or wh wh whoever it is i've never voted for a republican candidate in my whole life i'm constantly getting that i'm on the right but i think it's a tactic both because they don't have to do the intellectual work to rebut the arguments, so they can just a priori say that's not true, and it's a tactic because the left-wing media won't have me on, for example. So the left-wing media won't, it has a kind of allergy to any self-criticism. So then I'll go on the, on the right, uh, right, right-wing right media, and the people on the left will say, well, look, Bogosian's a right-winger. Well, no, I'm, I'm only going on the right because I'm more than happy. Rachel Maddow has nobody's ever invited me. I've actually invited myself and they won't have me. So I think it's a kind of strategy to not do the intellectual work to rebut the position because it's hard to it's hard to rebut the position. So you know, we've been talking about the the trans thing um and the main problem well, yeah, I think it is the main problem I have is I don't think children under 18 can consent to uh, you know, Luprin or surgery or it, what Abigail Schreier calls irreversible damage. And I just spoke to Helen Joyce about this. Um, uh, uh, um, she's from England. She's from, originally from I'm Ireland. Really yeah, yeah, she's her, a trans. It's great. And I just spoke to her about this. Um, so one of the things that she said in that interview that I was like, wow, I, like, I just literally never thought of it before. She said... So, so I, I always took the figure of 0.06, that 0.06% of the people were legitimately trans, and anything above that is a social contagion, right? It's kind of... But she said, no, that's not true. The whole thing is a culture-bound syndrome, like all of it. And I just, it really gave me pause, and I thought, well... I thought the the idea was that there was something operative in people's brains, you know, the whole born in the wrong body. And she said, no, it's just it's not true. I see. Well, I, long ago, uh, um, when it came out, I read um, Elaine, sorry, um, 
Have a go Jan, for it. Jan, Jan Morris. Oh, Jan Morris, yeah, yeah. Jan Morris's book, Conundrum, where she, yeah. was, she was a uh, journalist and she was, one, she was the only journalist, I think, on the original expedition that climbed Everest. Yeah. She didn't climb Everest, but, but in those days, um, James Morris was, was, was the journalist. And then um, she wrote this book explaining how she really did feel that she was a woman trapped in a man's body. And I was sympathetic to that. It seemed to me to be well argued. Uh, she's a very good writer. Uh, and she went through a tremendous ordeal. I mean, with hormone treatment and yeah, yeah. surgery and things as an adult. Uh, I think she had a sort of journey of about 10 years or maybe even longer. Um, so I sort of feel you have to respect somebody who sacrifices so much for yeah. that belief. Whereas people who just suddenly say, oh, I think I'll be a man or woman. Especially after they see the inside of the court and they've been sentenced as guilty. Oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> yes. Um, or, or that six foot two inch swimmer who, who towers oh, Leah over. Thomas, yeah. yeah I mean, and she, had, she was intact. So Leah Thomas had her penis. And my understanding is when she, Leah Thomas, I don't even know the pronouns, but when Leah Thomas was in the shower, there's the, there it was dangling out. And so th there is something about, uh, so, so you want to be compassionate, you want to be sympathetic. In a liberal society, you want to let people live the kind of lives they, they want to live and have all the rights they want to have. But with that said, that there, does seem, there, there do seem to be some, like Kathleen Stock, I was talking to her today, you know, women's only spaces. There, there is something, there's a prudence and a wisdom in that and to me, it's never been about people who are, I don't know, want to say actually trans, because I don't even know what that means, but it's that people can claim to be trans to access women's only spaces to abuse women. Or to, or to get swimming records. Yeah, to break records. To break, to break records and become a swimming champion. Yeah. Um, yes, but, but there are people, they may be deluded, but at least they've been through hell to get there. Um, yeah. And, um, yeah. Um, and as adults too, not not seduced as children by yeah. by doctors who. So that's the moral thing, right? So this is the thing that, that I'm thinking about about the trans issue. So somebody who is adamant and and so you know trans women are women, trans is it period trans women are women, and and from that it follows that they should be able to compete alongside natal women in sporting events. What I do not think is happening is the belief was formed on any you know rigorous epistemology evidence-based epistemology like in other words i don't think that they did a careful examination of the evidence and concluded that either the differences were trivial or there were no differences i think that they formed the belief that trans women and i always have to i i translate the word trans in my head as fake because i get mixed up by the words that trans women, NATO men should participate in women's sports on moral grounds. So there's no evidence that you can give, it's like the line thing where you stand on the line. There's no evidence that you can give them a tensile strength or cardio value, whatever, whatever the evidence would be, because the moral uh, intuition or the moral sentiment would override any consideration of evidence. So then how do you you're talking about a competing battle of morals. And I guess that kind of gets back to the substitution hypothesis. Like, wouldn't we rather have people in society... Okay, again, we would rather nobody have any delusion. But if it is the case that people are going to... That delusion is the default, then I don't, I don't want to say we should nudge them to benign delusions, but it would be certainly better for everybody if they had more benign delusions. Yes. I, I hope the substitution hypothesis is wrong. Yeah. I... I mean, if, if, it's, if it's right, I've kind of wasted my life, really, because I'm, I've, I've been simply trying to persuade people to be influenced by evidence. And if, if, that's, uh, if that's a losing, if that's a lost battle. I don't think it is. I, uh, but here, so let me throw this out to you. Do you think the best way to persuade people to be influenced by evidence is that it's a is that that, make, that act itself makes them a better person. So in other words, could you use a moral argument to persuade somebody to be influenced by evidence? Because what seems to not work is 
and I think uh, our friend Sam Harris has said this, that the, um, there's no evidence that you can give someone to persuade them to formulate their beliefs on the basis of evidence. So maybe you have a yeah. different tack. Yes, I, I, it would never occur to me to try to use a moral argument. I mean, I think my, I would prefer to go for science and say science is wonderful. Yeah. And science is um, poetic. Science is something that you really can devote your life to and feel fulfilled. And As you have. Well, yes, and so me, me, plenty of other people have. I mean, yeah. any, any scientist would probably say something like that. And really, it, the, the, the strides that humanity has made in science, in evidence-based, reality-based right. view of the world, is staggeringly impressive. We have made no strides through self-delusion. No. No delusions have no. cured cancer given us the CPU, sent us a rocket ship to Mars. That's right. I mean, and that, those are all sort of practical things, but also just understanding the size and shape and scope of the universe and time and space and, and the, the origin of all things and evolution. Uh, it's just amazing what a privilege it is to, to live in a world after Newton and Darwin and, and, and Max Planck. Um, and, and to understand the universe in which you live. And that's a wonderful, I almost say spiritual experience. And it's so much grander and so much bigger and so much more worthy, worthwhile, than petty little concerns. Yeah, you, you'll get no argument from me. So I guess just my question to you, um, let's say that you make that argument to somebody. Let's say that you make that argument to an administrator at an institution or in, at an institutional level. And it's a lovely argument, it's well articulated, it resonates with some people. And I'm, 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 uh, I'm, I'm telling you, one thing I have in my mind is when, when I was a teaching, I tried to get a science and pseudoscience class in the, uh, in the K through 12 system. And there was a single slide that my team had put on and it was about homeopathy. And, um, and they gave the presentation at two uh, uh, high schools and both administrators from the high school said, oh, you can't, you can't put that in there. The slide basically said, there's just no evidence for this. It didn't say, you know, it, it was, it, was it, it, it phrased it in the most polite way possible. Like this is not evidence, don't do this. And when the people from my team asked why, they said, well, people will be offended by that. Oh. People will be offended. We don't want to, we don't want to offend the parents who use homeopathy. But my, my point to you was that, so, so let's say that we want people to discover a love for science and a passion for evidence-based epistemology. Um, I know this is a weird question, but if you cannot persuade them by evidence and wonder at the universe and the instrumental use of technology for human beings, whether it's, you know, curing cancer, what have you, do you think that the moral argument is the way to go to persuade them? Well, I haven't quite grasped what you would mean by moral argument. Like, um, um, you should do good, pe good people formulate your beliefs on the basis of evidence. If you formulate your beliefs on the basis of evidence, you're more likely to construct something outside yourself to bring about your flourishing and your own community's flourishing. Formulating your beliefs, therefore, for something like a quick syllogism, formulating your beliefs on the basis of evidence is the moral thing to do. Because if you formulate it on the basis of non-evidence, you might end up planting a bomb to kill infidels. Correct. Yes. Or, yeah. If the poetry of reality fails to persuade people, do you think it's, what do you think of them using the moral argument to persuade people to formulate their beliefs on the basis of evidence? Or is that just a silly question? It wouldn't, no, it's not a, it, it wouldn't be my way. I, I prefer to go the Carl Sagan route um, and to try to persuade people of how wonderful science mm. is. Um, and of course, you, then you come up against, you get pushback from people who say, well, science gave us the H-bomb and, right, and right, things like that, right. and you have to, have to re reply to it. By the way, on homeopathy, it's not just that there's no evidence for it, there couldn't be evidence for it, right. because 
If you imagine doing a double-blind right. trial with a controller and an experimental, they're right. identical, and so, so there can be no evidence for it. Yeah, they'd be identical. You know, we, we did this um, video um, in which, so this, this, this oh, you're the perfect person to ask for this. So um, we did this video, <coughs> and one of the people said that there's no difference between uh, NATO men and NATO women. They're identical. And if you look at the bones, if you look at the skeletons of NATO women and NATO men, you couldn't tell the difference. Do you want to... <laughs> well, I mean, um, ar archaeologists can tell by the digging up right. bones that have been dead for tens of thousands of years. Right. So, so I, I uh, unfortunately, this conversation was off camera, but I said to this guy, I said, listen, Let's say that we get 10 skeletons right here. We have 10 skeletons and we do a double blind. We, 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 we find, you know, paleontologists, we find whoever would be a bona fide expert in this. And if all 10 of these people could correctly identify each time with a very small margin of error, would you be willing to change your mind um, and say, yes, there's a difference between male and female skeletons? And he said, no. And I said, well, well, why not? Because that would be like the gold standard for evidence. And he said, because it's not possible. And I said, okay, well, let's just hypothesize. This is a hypothetical. And I found, and I'm wondering if you found this too. Well, not possible. What, what do you mean by not possible? Well, that's what I said. And you, you get these experts and you give them these skeletons. And you yeah. get them to... Double blind, so they don't yeah. know which skeleton yeah. is which. Um, he said it's. He said it's not possible for them to tell the difference between well, male and female. He's pre prejudging the he experiment pre before, yeah. before you do the experiment. Yeah. And I said, well, just like hypothetically, let's yeah. just say hypothetically, yeah. the expert would would you be willing to change your mind? And he said, no. And the thing that that that, that is a very revealing answer. It's a, well, yeah, well, so um, that was going to be my question to you. So I I found that often the people who stand on the extreme lines, you know, strongly disagree, strongly agree. They have a an inability to imagine things. They have an inability to entertain hypothetical. Look, even if you couldn't do it by the anatomy of the skeleton, which I think you could, yeah. you've only got to take some DNA from the from the but from the bone, um, and if there's a Y chromosome, it's male. Um, it's absolutely coming. I mean, it's a hundred percent. There'd be no question about it. <laughs> um, and so, if you ask your your whoever it was you were talking to, yeah. would you not accept that evidence? Or would you, would you not accept it? You've got a, a thousand bones and, and, yeah. and every single one of them either has a Y chromosome or it doesn't. Right. And that is an absolutely cut and dried diagnostic. And would, would, would he still not, not accept it? I mean... Yeah, it's interesting. Um, somebody put out a, a really interesting tweet a few years ago, Eric Weinstein put out a tweet a year ago. If there's a conflict between biology and gender studies, on which on which side do you err? And I mean, it was the like, and I it just would be, it was just amazing to me how many how many of the responses or how many people as well gender studies. Yeah, because they, I mean, they they would say that the biology may show that these. These have a Y chromosome and these don't, but that's not how I define male and female. I mean, right. for, for them, it's a matter of of definition. So, um, to a, to a biologist, um, the the chromosomal definition would be watertight, but they could say, "Oh well, I I, I agree that 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 you you might find that half of them have Y chromosomes and half of them don't." But that's not how I define a female. So they they would they would take refuge behind a change of of language. So in that case, the way that the way that we would adjudicate the claim would be anything other than science would be arbitrary, would be subject to the moral caprices of the age. Yes, but they wouldn't use that kind of language. They wouldn't be, use a word like caprices. They would they would say things like um, human definitions are more important than science anyway, because they despise science. Or right, they or, do. Yeah. Because science is a meta narrative, it's a it's a way, like Leotard said, it's a way to explain explain the world. So that's the other thing. So we're dealing with people for whom um, 
there's an open antagonism to science, there's an open antagonism to reason and evidence. And uh, to, to borrow a turn of phrase, their cognitions have been colonized, right? They, they've been colonized by an exogenous ideology. And, and this is, I think, a difference between uh, faith and the new religion. So with, with uh, the, one of the old religions, ultimately when you start asking people questions and you've done this more than anybody, you start asking people questions about why they believe, once you've cleared through all the nonsense, they're going to say faith. That's just, yeah. once all the historical stuff falls and the testimony falls and the, whatever it is falls, they're going to say faith. The problem is that anybody who is a little knowledgeable about wokeism or whatever term we want to use, they will do one of a few things. They'll refer to a, a best-selling author, um, Ta-Nehisi Coates, Ibram X. Kendi, Robin DiAngelo, uh, etc. So they'll they'll refer to that, or they'll if they're knowledgeable and they're an academic, they'll talk about literature, the peer-reviewed literature. And that peer-reviewed literature has been, what I've written about before, it's been idea laundered. So you get a bunch of people who are ideologues together, uh, who already, they start with their conclusion first and they work backward from the conclusion, the exact opposite of science. So they start with their conclusion first, trans women or women, for example, or w w whatever whatever the conclusion is. They get together with other people who, who uh, have the similar beliefs. They make a journal. It goes in as a moral impulse. It gets idea laundered and it comes out as a fact. So those people... They don't, no, nobody who, who, who buys into the ideology will ever use the word faith because they have authors and they have kind of high priests of the ideology who have um, either written books about this stuff, so they'll reference a book. But the books themselves, they're predicated on nothing. They're just, they're completely made up. The whole thing is made up. And so they don't need, they don't need faith for that. Yes. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a more intractable, intractable problem than someone just saying, yeah, I believe this guy walked on water. And after you ask them 20 questions or Socratic questions or so, they say, well, I just, it's my faith. I believe it in my heart. Well, these folks aren't operating that way. I mean, they're operating in the way that they have these strong moral impulses and they feel things very deeply about social justice or the way, the correct way we've been hor horrifically treated people in the past. There's no question. But there is something different about, and this is why I think, this is why I think that the, one of the primary dangers we face now is the wholesale capture of the academy. Because the academy is giving these people jobs for life. They're not allowing dissident voices to come in. They're pumping out utter mad, I mean, complete madness. That's what, what we try to do in the Sokol Squared thing to try to, you know, take the robes off, sh show that the emperor has no clothes. But in tr traditional religions, it, it just doesn't have that sophistication. It doesn't have that imprimatur of institutional legitimacy that you get from what we have now with organizational capture. I hope not in science departments, although unfortunately I do think there's some evidence for capture in science journals. Yeah. For sure. Um, Jerry's been writing about that. Jerry yes, Clark. that's right, in Scientific American and, and Nature. Um, but I think the capture of universities is maybe true of departments of sociology and um, anthropology, perhaps, humanities. Mm. Um, but I hope not all. Yeah. Yeah, I, I wonder, I've, I've been thinking about, I've been thinking a lot about and everybody's talking about a unified field theory. Um, it's all the rage in science. I've been wondering if, what do you think? Do you think that there could be like a, excuse me, like a unified field theory of rationality, like certain core components that make somebody rational, that unify different? Well, uh, um, I suppose the organization that I, my nonprofit I'm in, the Center for Inquiry, is, is been devoted its time to tell us about this. that tell us about well that. it's 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 has partly a, an atheistic secular arm 
and it has partly a skeptical arm that fights homeopathy and telepathy and psychokinesis and th things like that. So, so it's it's in in the business runs two journals: one a journal, a secular journal, and called Free Inquiry, and one a skeptical journal about all the other stuff, which is called the Skeptical Inquirer. And it's been at it for decades now, and um, I think we've. we've I sort of now realise that, that 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 we have a, a new problem on our hands. Right. Um, Neil deGrasse Tyson mm. a few years ago had this idea of a of a, a virtual nation called Rationalia, um, yeah, and that. and he was going around inviting people to become citizens of the of, <laughs> of, of this. Of this. <laughs> Can I join? Yes. Yeah. How, how do you think? What do you think is the best way to move the needle on this stuff? As I say, I, th I can, cannot do better than the Carl Sagan way of inspiring people with the poetry of reality, mm. science. Mm. What's, you know, when we, did a, when we did our last event and I, and I read your autobiography, I remember something in there about, um, it was just so obvious that the process, that for you that science was a process and doing it was a reward. Right, so there's something um, emotionally. Was it, would you say okay? I guess that's a quick. Would you say there's something emotionally fulfilling about doing that kind of intellectual work? Definitely. Yeah. <clears throat> yes. What would it? What was it like? A sense of satisfaction, or what? what would it... uh, yes, um, satisfaction in understanding why you exist mm. and why the world around you exists. I mean, it's hard to imagine in a way, a greater sense of satisfaction than that. And biology is one of the few fields that can actually answer why we're here. Maybe not in a... In a yes, yeah. it, that's true. And, and since Darwin and his successors, we can do that, not in detail, but in broad outline, we, we can. And um, I think that should give us courage with respect to physics and cosmology as well. I mean, with the, because there was a time when... Um, People who wish to uh, infer the, ne the need for a divine creator thought that biology was by far the strongest argument they had. Mm. Now they've rather given up on biology yeah. because Darwin, Darwin solved that one. And so they moved on to cosmology and the origin of all things. And um, I think that the fact that Darwin solved that problem and Darwin, Darwinian solved that problem for biology should give us courage to move on to physics and cosmology. Is there, is there anything, I mean, I, I'm not a biologist, obviously, but is there any, any huge area of biology that we haven't figured out yet? Well, the origin of life, we don't know about that. I mean, we, Darwin, as it were, takes over when, when, once you've got a self-replicating molecule, which can give... DNA, and this probably wasn't DNA originally. Um, once you've got that, then Darwinian natural selection takes over and, and you get the whole glorious spreading out of life and, and the illusion of design, the complexity of life. Um, there's that. Uh, I don't think we understand consciousness, subjective consciousness. Um, it's obviously it's a manifestation of brains, but how it comes about, uh, we don't understand. I, I think in that case, we don't even know what an answer would look like. Mm. In the case of the origin of life, we know what it would look like. Mm. Mm. It's a seemingly unusual question, but are you happy that you, are you, if you were to do it over again, and I'm almost positive you'd say you'd go into science, would you go into biology again? I think so, yes. Um, I sometimes thought I might go into computer programming. I, really? I, I, was, I was addicted to computer programming Oh, in my... 30s and 40s. Really? Yes. So for you, you think there's something unique about biology that gave you a kind of satisfaction that another, another intellectual discipline would not? I am not mathematical enough to do physics. Yeah. Uh, and so um, it's, look, this is hard. I shouldn't really admit that, but yeah. But, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. You know, in our, one of our last uh, talks I asked you about the Fermi paradox. Where is everybody? Where is everybody? Um, and you, one of the things that you said was, 
if there are intelligent life forms in the universe, they would be subject to natural selection. Yes. Yeah, and I've been thinking about that for like <laughs> a long time. Could you explain that? Well, I wrote a paper uh, uh, called Universal Darwinism, which looked at the, all the alternatives that have ever been suggested, which is mostly Lamarckian, uh, both the principle of use and disuse. The more, the more you use a bit of your body, the, big, the bigger and stronger it gets. Yeah. And then the second one is the inheritance of acquired characteristics. So the, your arms get bigger and stronger because you use them, and then it's passed on to the next generation. That, that's Lamarckian evolution in its simplest form. And that happens not to be true on this planet, mm. but it's not inconceivable, it's easy to imagine another planet in which it is true. Um, but my point in that paper was that even if it's true that acquired characteristics are inherited, it's not a big enough theory to account for the evolution of complexity. It, can, it may account for big muscles, but it can't account for the fine... The, de the, the, the delicate uh, adjustment of the eye, for example. I mean, this beautiful structure, this beautiful camera, which has a, a matrix of, of um, light-sensitive cells, millions of light-sensitive cells, mm. a three-color a three system, just, just, like a, mm. just like a computer screen. Um, and um, you, cannot do, you can't get that by the principle of use and disuse. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's not the case that the more you use an eye, the better it gets, the, more, the better it is at, at focusing and resolving. And you get that how? Natural selection. No matter how detailed, no matter how deeply buried in the, in the body something is, natural selection will, will smell it out. Natural selection will detect it. Is natural selection a necessary mechanism for organisms that evolve, no, actually, if I say evolve, that gives away the show. But is natural selection a necessary mechanism for organisms anywhere in the universe? I think so. I, th I think it's, the, it's certainly the only one that anybody's ever suggested. Um, is, it, is, it, is it also necessary for non-carbon-based life? Yes, I think so. Um, if there is non-carbon-based life, which I, I doubt, but that's a separate issue. Mm. I mean, if I, well, you could imagine silicon-based life or something. Yeah. Well, I, I suppose it's open to somebody to find a, an alternative, but, yeah. but nobody ever has. And I think it's something so powerful about natural selection, this, this non-random seeking out of, of improvement. Yeah. Um, and it's capable of uh, not just blacksmith's arms kind of thing, muscular growth. It's capable of fine chiseling every single detail of the animal, right down to the cellular level, the biochemical level, every single thing that affects its survival and reproductive success, no matter how deeply buried within the animal, if it, if it has even the slightest effect upon the survival prospects of the animal, then natural selection will pick it out, favor it. Uh, utterly extraordinary. And Darwin said this, uh, um, Nature is daily and hourly scrutinizing mm. every detail. So one thing that you said that I want to come back to, you said you doubt non, like a silicon-based life. Well, that's a separate issue. And, and I'm, I'm not a chemist, but I'm yeah. a chemist. Every chemist I've ever spoken to about it thinks it's got to be carbon-based. Because... Um, Carbon is so prolific in forming um, huge molecules of, of joining up with, the, with other yeah. carbon atoms and with other, other atoms as well. And I think it's probably going to be protein-based as well because protein is the special kind of organic molecule which forms itself spontaneously into three-dimensional shapes which are determined by the one-dimensional sequence of units which are amino acids and that three-dimensional shape of a protein is what gives it its catalytic properties its enzymatic properties and so the whole of our kind of life at any rate is run on enzymes which are 
catalysts, protein molecules, which, because of their three-dimensional shape, speed up chemical mm. reactions hugely, orders of magnitude, many, many orders of magnitude. And that's how life is run. And the one-dimensional sequence of amino acids, which is what determines the three-dimensional shape of the enzyme, the one-dimensional sequence of amino acids is determined by the one-dimensional sequence of codons in DNA. Well, I'm not sticking out my neck and saying that any alien life is going to have DNA. Probably not. But I think it probably is going to have protein. Probably a completely different repertoire of proteins from ours, but nevertheless proteins. And there will be some kind of genetics, which I think I stick my neck out and oh, say it's going to be digital genetics. Really? Though if not, not DNA, but anyway, digital genetics and which might be one-dimensional, might be two-dimensional, probably not three-dimensional. Um, and it will be Darwinian life. Is Again, I stick my neck out. I just want to say in conclusion, you, your work has been unbelievably inspirational to me in my life. And, um, yeah, and um, it's been intellectually inspirational, and it's really been a beacon for me about not just how to think about things, but how to how to be courageous when you walk through the world. And so I just really wanted to thank you I for mean, that. I mean, certainly that. And I worry a little bit that, that we've been agreeing with each other so much that people are going to say we don't want to do this. <laughs> well, that's okay. <laughs> yeah. you know. Anyway, thank you very much. Yeah, I, I appreciate it. Very much. Thank you. Thank you.